Chapter 5. Flight into Space With the Mariner R project officially activated in the fall of 1961, and the launch vehicle selected, engineers proceeded at full speed to meet the difficult launch schedule. A preliminary design was adopted in late September, when the scientific experiments to be carried out on board were also selected. By October 2nd, a schedule had been established that would deliver two spacecraft to the assembly building in Pasadena by January the 15th and 29th, 1962 respectively, with the spares to follow in two weeks. During the week of November the 6th, tests were underway to determine problems involved in mating a mock-up of the spacecraft with the Agena shroud and adapter assembly. A thermal control model of the spacecraft had already gone into a small space simulator at JPL for preliminary temperature tests. MR-1, the first Mariner scheduled for flight, was in assembly immediately after January 8, 1962, and the process was complete by the end of the month, when electrical and magnetic field tests had been started. At the same time, assembly of MR-2 was underway, Work on MR-1 was a week ahead of schedule by the end of month. A full-scale temperature control model of the spacecraft went into the large space simulator on February 26th. In mid-March, system tests began on both spacecraft and it was decided that the flight hardware would be tested only in the small simulator, with a temperature control model continuing in the large chamber. On March 26th, MR-1 was subjected to full-scale mating tests with the shroud cover and the adapter for mounting the spacecraft on top of the Agena. MR-2 was undergoing vibration tests during the week of April 16th. By April 30th, MR-1 had completed vibration tests and had been mapped for magnetic fields, so that once compensated for, they would not interfere with the magnometer experiment in space. A dummy run of MR-1 was conducted on May 7th, and the spacecraft, space flight centre and computing equipment were put through a simulated operations test run during that same week. By May 14th, clean-up and final inspection by microscope had begun on MR-1 and MR-2 and MR-3. The latter spacecraft had been assembled from the spares. Soon after, the first two van loads of equipment were shipped to Cape Canaveral. The final system test of MR-1 was completed on May 21st, and the test of MR-2 followed during the same week. During the week of May 28th, all three spacecraft and their associated ground support equipment were packed, loaded, and shipped to the Atlantic Missile Range, AMR. At the same time, the Atlas-designated launch MR-1 went aboard a C-133 freight aircraft at San Diego. On the same day, an Air Force order grounded all C-133s for inspection and the plane did not depart until June 9th. By June 11th, 1962, the firing dates had been established and both spacecraft were ready for the launching. The Atlas booster had already been erected on the launch pad. The dummy run and a joint flight acceptance test were completed on MR-1 during the week of July 2nd. Final flight preparations and system test of MR-1 and the system test of MR-2 were concluded a week later. Thus, in 324 days, a new spacecraft project had been activated, the design, assembly and testing had been completed, and the infinite number of decisions pertaining to launch, AMR range operations, deep space tracking and data processing activities had been made and implemented. Venus was approaching the Earth at the end of its 19-month excursion around the Sun. The launch vehicles and Mariners 1 and 2 stood ready to go from Cape Canaveral's launch complex number 12. The events leading to the first close-up look at Venus and intervening space were about to reach their first crisis, a fiery explosion over the Atlantic Ocean. Mariner 1. An Abortive Launch After 570 hours of testing, Mariner 1 was poised on top of the Atlas Agena launch vehicle during the night of July 20th, 1962. The time was right. The range and the tracking net were standing by. The launch vehicles were ready to cast off the spacecraft for Venus. 
The countdown was begun at 11.33 p.m. EST, July 20th, after several delays because of trouble in the range safety command system. At the time, the launch count stood at T-176 minutes, if all went well, 176 minutes until the booster engines were ignited. Another hold delayed the count until 12.37 a.m. July 21st, when counting was resumed at T-165 minutes. The count then proceeded without incident to T-79 minutes at 2.20 a.m., when uncertainty over the cause of a blown fuse in the range safety circuits caused the operations to be scrubbed or cancelled for the night. The next launch attempt was scheduled for July 21st-22nd. The second launch countdown for Mariner 1 began shortly before midnight, July 21st. Spacecraft power had been turned on at 11.08pm, with the launch count at T-200 minutes. At T-135 minutes, the weather looked good. A 41-minute hold was required at minus 130 minutes, 12.17 a.m. July 22nd, in order to change a noisy component in the ground tracking system. When counting was resumed at T-130 minutes, the clock read 12.48 a.m. A previously scheduled hold was called at T-60 minutes, lasting from 1.58 to 2.38 a.m. The good weather still held. At T-80 seconds, Power fluctuations in the radio guidance system forced a 34-minute halt. Time was resumed at 4.16am, when the countdown was set back to T-5 minutes. At exactly 4.21 and 23 seconds am EST, the Atlas thundered to life and lifted off the pad, bearing its Venus-bound load. The boost phase looked good until the range safety officer began to notice an unscheduled, your left, northeast manoeuvre. By 4.25am, it was evident that if allowed to continue, the vehicle might crash in the North Atlantic shipping lanes or in some inhabited area. Steering commands were being supplied, but faulty application of the guidance equations was taking the vehicle far off course. Finally, at 4.26 and 16 seconds a.m., after 293 seconds of flight, and with just six seconds left before separation of the Atlas and Agena, after which the launch vehicle could not be destroyed, a range safety officer hit the destruct button. A flash of light illuminated the sky, and the choppy Atlantic waters were awash with the glowing death of a space probe. Even as it fluttered down to the sea, however, the radio transponder of the shattered Mariner 1 continued to transmit for one minute and four seconds after the destroy command had been sent. Mariner 1 did not succumb easily. Mariner 2. A roll before parking. Ever since Mariner 2 had arrived at the Cape on June the 4th, test teams of all organisations had laboured day and night to prepare the spacecraft for launch. The end of their efforts culminated after some 690 hours of test time, both in California and in Florida. 35 days after Mariner 1 met its explosive end, the first countdown of Mariner 2 was underway. At 6.43pm EST, August 25th, 1962, time was picked up. The countdown did not proceed far, however. The Atlas crew asked for a hold at T-205 minutes, 8.39pm because of stray voltages in the command destruct system caused by a defective Agena battery. After considerable delay, the launch effort was scrubbed at 10.06pm. The second launch attempt started at 6.37pm August 26th, with the Atlas Agena B and Mariner 2 ready on the pad. At 9.52pm T-100 minutes, a 40-minute hold was called to replace the Atlas main battery. By 10.37, with 95 minutes to launch, all spacecraft systems were ready to go. A routine hold at T-60 minutes was extended beyond 30 minutes in order to verify the spacecraft battery life expectation. At 11.48pm, with the count standing at T-55 minutes, the spacecraft, the vehicles, the range and the DSIF were all given the green light. When good launching weather was reported at 12.18am August 27th, just 25 minutes from liftoff, a cautious optimism began to mount in the blockhouse and amongst the tired crews. 
but the tension began to build again. The second pre-scheduled hold at T-minus five minutes was extended beyond a half hour, when the radio guidance system had difficulty with ground station power. Counting was picked up and the clock continued to move around to 60 seconds before liftoff. Suddenly the radio guidance system was in trouble again. Fluctuations showed in its rate beacon signals and another hold was called. Still another hold for the same reason followed at T-50 seconds. This time at 1.30am the count was set back to T-5 minutes. One further crisis developed during this hold. Only three minutes of pre-launch life remained in Atlas's main battery. A quick decision was made to hold the switchover to missile power until the T-60 seconds to help conserve the life of the battery. At 1.48am the count was resumed again at T-5 minutes. The long seconds began to drag. Finally the conveyor test director pressed the fire button. Out on the launch pad, the Atlas engines ignited with a white puff and began to strain against the retaining bolts as 360,000 pounds of thrust began to build up. In a holocaust of noise and flame, the Atlas was released and lifted off the launch pad on a bearing of 106.8 degrees at exactly 1 hour, 53 minutes, 13.927 seconds in the morning of August the 27th, 1962. Mariner 2 was on its way to listen to the music of the spheres. As the launch vehicle roared up into the night sky, the JPL launch checkout station, DSIF-0, tracked the spacecraft until Mariner disappeared over the horizon. A quick preliminary evaluation of spacecraft data showed normal readings, and Atlas seemed to be flying a true course. The AMR in-flight data transmission and computational operations were being performed as expected. With liftoff out of the way, the launch began to look good. After the radio signal from the ground guidance system cut off the engines and the booster section was jettisoned, the remaining Atlas forward section, plus the Agena and the spacecraft, began to roll. However, it stabilised itself in a normal attitude. Although the Atlas had not gone out of the range safety restrictions, it was within just three degrees of exceeding the Agena horizon sensor limits, which would have forced another aborted mission. After the booster separation, the Atlas sustainer and vernier engines continued to burn until they were shut off by radio guidance command. Shortly thereafter, spring-loaded bolts ejected the nose cone shroud which had protected the spacecraft against frictional heating in the atmosphere. Simultaneously, the gyroscopes in the Agena were started, and at about 1.58am, the Agena and the spacecraft separated from the now spent Atlas, which was retarded by small retro rockets and drifted back into the atmosphere, where it was destroyed by friction on re-entry. The Parking Orbit As the Agena separated from the Atlas booster vehicle, it was programmed to pitch down almost 15 degrees, putting it roughly parallel with the local horizon. Then, following a brief coasting period, the Agena engine ignited at 1.58 and 53 seconds a.m. and fired until 2.01 and 12 seconds a.m., Cut-off occurred at a predetermined value of velocity. Both the Agena and the spacecraft had now reached a speed of approximately 18,000 miles per hour and had gone into an Earth orbit at an altitude of 116.19 statute miles. The second stage and the spacecraft were now in a parking orbit, which would allow the vehicle to coast out to a point more favourable than Cape Canaveral for blasting off Mariner for Venus. During the launch, Cape Radar had tracked the radar beacon on the Agena, losing it on the horizon at 2am and 53 seconds. Radar stations at Grand Bahama Island, San Salvador, Ascension, the Twin Falls Victory Ship and Pretoria in South Africa continued to track downrange. Meanwhile, Antigua had locked on and tracked the spacecraft's radio transponder and telemetry from 1.58 to 2.08am, when it went over to the Antigua horizon. Sidebar. The sequence of events in the launch phase of the Mariner flight to Venus. 1. Liftoff. 2. Atlas booster engine cutoff. 3. Atlas sustainer engine cutoff. 4. Atlas vernier engine cutoff. 5. Spacecraft shroud ejection. 6. 
Atlas Agena B separation. 7. Agena B first ignition. 8. Agena B first cutoff. 9. Agena B second ignition. 10. Agena B second cutoff. 11. Spacecraft separation. 12. Initiate Agena Yaw maneuver. 13. Complete Agena Yaw maneuver. 14. Expel unused Agena propellant. End of sidebar. The second coasting period lasted 16.3 minutes, a time determined by the ground guidance computer and transmitted to the Agena during the vernier burning period of her atlas. Then Agena restarted its engine and fired for a second time. At the end of this firing period, both the Agena and Mariner still attached had been injected into a transfer trajectory to Venus at a velocity exceeding that required to escape the Earth's gravity. The actual injection into space occurred at 26 minutes 3.08 seconds after liftoff from the Cape to 19 and 19 seconds AM EST at a point 14.873 degrees south latitude and 2.007 degrees west longitude. Thus Mariner made the break for Venus about 360 miles northeast of St. Helena, 2,500 miles east of the Brazilian coast and about 900 miles west of Angola on the West African shore. During injection, the vehicle was being tracked by Ascension, telemetry ship Twin Falls Victory and Pretoria. Telemetry ship Whiskey secured the spacecraft signal just after injection and tracked until 2.26 a.m. Pretoria began its telemetry track at 2.21 and continued to track for almost two hours until 4.19 a.m. Injection velocity was 7.07 miles per second, or 25,420 miles per hour, just beyond Earth's escape speed. The distance at the time of injection from Canaveral's Launch Complex 12 was 4,081.3 miles. The Agena and Mariner flew the escape path together for another two minutes after injection before they were separated at 2.21 a.m. Agena then performed a 140-degree yaw or retro turn manoeuvre by expelling unused propellants. The purpose was to prevent the unsterilised Agena from possibly hitting the planet and from following Mariner too close and perhaps disturbing its instruments. Now Mariner 2 was flying alone and clear. Ahead lay a journey of 109 days and more than 180 million miles. Orientation and Mid-Course Maneuver As Mariner 2 headed into space, the Deep Space Instrumentation Facility, DSIF, network began to track the spacecraft. At 2.53 and 59 seconds a.m., DSIF-5 at Johannesburg, aided by the mobile tracking station installed in vans in the vicinity, was looking at the spacecraft just four minutes after injection. Johannesburg was able to track Mariner until 4.04 p.m., because as the trajectory took Mariner almost radially away from the Earth, our planet began in effect to turn away from under the spacecraft. On an Earth map, because of its course and the rotation of the Earth, Mariner 2 appeared to describe a great arc over the Indian Ocean far to the west of Australia, and then to turn north and west, and to proceed straight west over the south-central Africa across the Atlantic, and over the Amazon basin of northern South America. Johannesburg finally lost track at a point over the middle of South America. While swinging over the Indian Ocean on its first pass, the spacecraft was acquired by Woomera's DSIF-4 at 2.42 and 30 seconds a.m., and tracked until 8.08 a.m., when Mariner was passing just to the north of Madagascar on a westerly course. Goldstone did not acquire the spacecraft until it was approaching the east coast of South America at 3.12 p.m. August the 27th. With Mariner slowly tumbling in free space, it was now necessary to initiate a series of events to stop the spacecraft in the proper flight position. At 2.27 a.m., 44 minutes after launch, the Mariner central computer and sequencer on board the spacecraft issued a command for explosively activated pin pullers to release the solar panels 
and the radiometer dish from their launch-secured positions. At 2.53, 60 minutes after liftoff, the attitude control system was turned on, and the sun orientation sequence began with the extension of the directional antenna to a preset angle of 72 degrees. Roll maneuver, antenna up, pitch maneuver, motor burn, sun reacquisition, antenna reposition, earth reacquisition. The sun sensors then activated the gas jets and moved the spacecraft about until the roll, or long axis, was pointed at the sun. This manoeuvre required only two and a half minutes after the CC and S issued the command. The solar panel output of 195 watts was somewhat higher than anticipated, as were the spacecraft temperatures, which decreased and stabilised six hours after the spacecraft orientated itself on the sun. On August 29th, a command from Johannesburg turned on the crew's scientific experiments, including all of the instruments except the two radiometers. The rate of data transmission was then observed to decrease as planned and the data conditioning system was functioning normally. For seven days, no attempt was made to orient the spacecraft with respect to the Earth, because the Earth sensors were too sensitive to operate properly at such a close range. On September 3rd, the CC and S initiated the Earth acquisition sequence. The gyroscopes were turned on, the crew's scientific instruments were temporarily switched off, and a search for the Earth began about the roll axis of the spacecraft. During this manoeuvre, the long axis of the spacecraft was held steady in a position pointing at the sun, and the gas jets rolled the spacecraft around this axis until the sensors mounted in a directional antenna could see the Earth. Apparently, the Earth sensor was already viewing the Earth, because the transmitter output immediately switched from Omni to the directional antenna, indicating that no search was necessary. However, the initial brightness reading from the Earth sensor was 38, an intensity that might be expected if the spacecraft was locked onto the Moon instead of the Earth. As a result, the mid-course manoeuvre was delayed until verification of Earth lock was obtained. Mariner's injection into the Venus trajectory yielded a predicted miss of 233,000 miles in front of the planet, well within the normal miss pattern expected as a result of the launch. Because the spacecraft was designed to cross the orbit of Venus behind the planet and pass between it and the Sun, it was necessary to correct the trajectory to an approximate 8,000 to 40,000 mile flyby so the scientific instruments could operate within their designed ranges. After comparison of the actual flight path with that required for the proper near-miss, the necessary roll, pitch and motor burn commands were generated by the JPL computers. When on September the 4th it had been established that the spacecraft was indeed orientated on the Earth and not on the Moon, a set of three commands was transmitted to the spacecraft from the Goldstone to be stored in the electronic memory unit until the start of the command was sent. At 1.30pm PST, the first commands were transmitted. A 9.33 degree roll turn, a 139.83 degree pitch turn, and a motor burn command to produce a 69.5 miles per hour velocity change. At 2.39pm, a fourth command was sent to switch from the directional antenna to the omni antenna. Finally, a command went out instructing the spacecraft to proceed with the now memorized maneuver program. Mariner then turned off the Earth and Sun sensors, moved the directional antenna out of the path of the rocket exhaust stream, and executed a 9.33 degree roll turn in 51 seconds. Next, the pitch turn was completed in 13 and one quarter minutes turning the spacecraft almost completely around so that the motor nozzle would point in the correct direction when fired. The spacecraft was stabilised and the roll and pitch turns controlled by gyroscopes, which signalled the attitude control systems the rate of correction for comparison with the already computed values. With the solar panels no longer directly oriented on the sun, the battery began to share the power demand and finally carried the entire load until the spacecraft had again been oriented on the sun. At the proper time, the motor controlled by the CC and S ignited and burned for 27.8 seconds, 
while the spacecraft's acceleration was compared with the predetermined values by the accelerometer. During this period, when the gas jets could not operate properly, the spacecraft was stabilised by movable vanes or rudders in the exhaust of the mid-course motor. The velocity added by the mid-course motor resulted in a decrease of the relative speed of the spacecraft with respect to the Earth by 59 miles per hour, from 6,748 to 6,689 miles per hour, while the speed relative to the Sun increased by 45 miles per hour, from 60,117 to 60,162 miles per hour. This apparently paradoxical condition occurred because in order to intercept Venus, Mariner had been launched in a direction opposite to the Earth's course around the Sun. The mid-course manoeuvre turned the spacecraft around and slowed its travel away from the Earth while allowing it to increase its speed around the Sun in the direction of the Earth's orbit. Gradually then, the spacecraft would begin to fall in towards the Sun while moving in the same direction as the Earth, catching and passing the Earth on the 65th day and intersecting Venus's orbit on the 109th day. At the time of the mid-course manoeuvre, the spacecraft was travelling slightly inside the Earth's orbit by 70,000 miles, and was behind the Earth by 1,492,500 miles. The Long Cruise After its completion of the mid-course manoeuvre, Mariner reoriented itself on the Sun in seven minutes, and on the Earth in about 30 minutes. During the mid-course manoeuvre, the omnidirectional antenna was used. Now, with the manoeuvre completed, the directional antenna was switched back in for the duration of the mission. Ever since the spacecraft had left the parking orbit near the Earth and been injected into the Venus trajectory, the Space Flight Operations Centre back in Pasadena had been the nerve centre of the mission. Telemetered data had been coming in from the DSIF stations on a 24-hour schedule. During the cruise phase from September the 5th to December the 7th, a total of 16 orbit computations were needed to make perfect the planet encounter prediction. On December 7th, the first noticeable Venus-caused effect on Mariner's trajectory were observed, causing a definite deviation of the spacecraft's flight path. On September the 8th at 12:50 p.m. EST, the spacecraft lost its attitude control, which caused the power serving the scientific instruments to switch off and the gyroscopes to switch on automatically for approximately three minutes, after which normal operation was resumed. The cause was not apparent, but the chances of a strike by some small space object seemed good. As a result of this event, a significant difference in the apparent brightness reading of the Earth sensor was noted. This sensor had been causing concern for some time, because its readings had decreased to almost zero. Further decrease, if actually caused by the instrument and not by the telemetry sensing elements, could result in loss of Earth lock and the failure of radio contact. After the incident of September the 8th, the Earth sensor brightness reading increased from 6 to 63, a normal indication for that day. Thereafter, this measurement decreased in an expected manner as the spacecraft increased its distance from Earth. Mariner 2 was now embarked on the long cruise. On September the 12th, the distance from Earth was 2,678,960 miles, and the spacecraft's speed relative to the Earth was 6,497 miles per hour. Mariner was accelerating its speed as the Sun's gravity began to exert a stronger pull than the Earth's. On September the 3rd, Mariner was nearly 6 million miles out, and moving at 6,823 miles per hour relative to the Earth. A total of 55,600,000 miles had been covered to that point. Considerable anxiety had developed at JPL, when Mariner's Earth sensor reading had fallen off so markedly. This situation was relieved by the unexplained return to normal on September the 8th, although the day-to-day -day change in the brightness number was watched closely. The apparent ability of the spacecraft to recover its former performance after the loss of attitude control on September the 8th and again on September the 29th was an encouraging sign. Another disturbing event occurred on October the 31st, when the output from one solar panel deteriorated abruptly. 
the entire power load was thrown onto the other panel, which was then dangerously near its maximum rated output. To alleviate this situation, the crew's scientific instruments were turned off. A week later, the malfunctioning panel returned to normal operation, and the science instruments were again turned on. Although the trouble had cleared temporarily, it developed again on November the 15th, and again never corrected itself. The diagnosis was a partial short circuit between one string of solar cells and the panel frame, but by now the spacecraft was close enough to the sun so that one panel supplied enough power. By October the 24th, the spacecraft was 10 million and 30,000 miles from Earth and was moving at 10,547 miles per hour relative to the Earth. The distance from Venus was now 21,266,000 miles. October the 30th was the 65th day of the mission, and at 5 a.m. PST, Mariner overtook and passed the Earth at a distance of 11,500,000 miles. Since the spacecraft's direction of travel had in effect been reversed by the mid-course manoeuvre, it had been gaining on the Earth in the direction of its orbit, although constantly falling away from the Earth in the direction of the Sun. The point of equal distance between the Earth and Venus was passed on November the 6th, when Mariner was 13,900,000 miles from both planets and travelling at 13,843 miles per hour relative to Earth. As November wore on, hope for a successful mission began to mount. Using tracking data rather than assumptions of standard mid-course performance, the Venus miss distance had now been revised to about 21,000 miles and encounter was predicted for December the 14th. But the DSIF tracking crews, the space flight and computer operators, and the management staff could not yet relax. The elation following the successful trajectory correction manoeuvre on September the 4th had given way alternately to discouragement and guarded optimism. Four telemetry measurements were lost on December the 9th and never returned to normal. They measured the angle of the antenna hinge, the fuel tank pressure, and the nitrogen pressure in the mid-course and attitude control systems. A blown fuse, designed to protect the data encoder from short circuits in the sensors, was suspected. However, these channels could not affect spacecraft operation, and Mariner continued to perform normally. The rising temperatures recorded on the spacecraft were more serious. Only the solar panels were displaying expected temperature readings, some of the others were as much as 75 degrees above the values predicted for Venus encounter. The heat increase became more rapid after November the 20th. By December 12th, six of the temperature sensors had reached their upper limits. It was feared that the failure point of the equipment might be exceeded. The CC and S performed without incident until just before encounter, when for the first time it failed to yield certain pulses. JPL engineers were worried about the starting of the encounter sequence due the next day, although they knew that Earth-based radio could send these commands if necessary. On December 12th, with the climax of the mission near, the spacecraft was 34,218,000 miles from the Earth, with a speed away from the Earth of 35,790 miles per hour, a sun-relative speed of 83,900 miles per hour. Only 635,525 miles from Venus at this point, Mariner 2 was closing fast on the cloud-shrouded planet. But it was a hot spacecraft that was carrying its load of inquisitive instruments to the historic encounter. Encounter and Beyond On its 109th day of travel, Mariner had approached Venus in a precarious condition, Seven of its overheated temperature sensors had reached their upper telemetry limits. The Earth's sensor brightness reading stood at three, zero was the nominal threshold, and was dropping. Some 149 watts of power were being consumed out of the 165 watts still available from the crippled solar panels. At JPL Space Flight Operations Centre, there was reason to believe that the ailing CC and S might not command the spacecraft into its encounter sequence at the proper time. Twelve hours before encounter, these fears were verified. Quickly, the emergency Earth-originated command was prepared for transmission. At 5.35am PST, 
a radio signal went out from Goldstone's Echo Station. 36 million miles away, Mariner 2 responded to the tiny pulse of energy from the Earth and began its encounter sequence. After Mariner had acknowledged receipt of the command from the Earth, the spacecraft switched into the encounter sequence as engineering data were turned off and the radiometers began their scanning motion, taking up and down readings across the face of the planet. As throughout the long cruise, the four experiments monitoring the magnetic fields, cosmic dust, charged particles, and solar plasma experiments continued to operate. As Mariner approached Venus on its night side, it was travelling about 88,400 miles per hour with respect to the Sun. At the point of closest approach, at 11.59 and 28 seconds AM PST, the distance from the planet was 21,598 miles. During encounter with Venus, three scans were made, one on the dark side, one across the terminator dividing dark and sunlit sides, and one on the sunlit side. Although the scan went slightly beyond the edge of the planet, the operation proceeded smoothly and good data were received on Earth. With encounter completed, the crew's condition was re-established by radio command from the Earth and the spacecraft returned to transmitting engineering data, together with the continuing readings of the four crew scientific experiments. After approaching closer to the planet and making more meaningful scientific measurements than any man-made space probe, Mariner 2 continued on into an orbit around the Sun. December 27th, 13 days after the Venus encounter, marked the perihelion, or point of Mariner's closest approach to the Sun, 65,505,935 miles. The Sun-related speed was 89,442 miles per hour. As Mariner began to pull away from the Sun in the following months, its Sun reference speed would decrease. Data was still being received during these final days, and the Earth and the Sun lock were still being maintained although the antenna hinge angle was no longer being automatically readjusted by the spacecraft. Commands were sent from Earth in an attempt to get the antenna pointed at the Earth, even if the Earth sensor were no longer operating properly. At 2am EST, January 3rd, 1963, 20 days after passing Venus, Mariner finished transmitting 30 minutes of telemetry data to Johannesburg, and the station shut down its operation. When Woomera's DSIF-4 later made a normal search for the spacecraft signal, it could not be found. Goldstone also searched in vain for the spacecraft's transmissions, but apparently Mariner's voice had at last died, although the spacecraft would go into an eternal orbit about the Sun. It was estimated that Mariner's aphelion, furthest point out in its orbit around the Sun, would occur on June 18, 1963 at a distance of 113,813,087 miles. Maximum closest distance from the Earth would be 98,063,599 miles on March 30, 1963. Closest approach to the Earth, 25,765,717 miles on September 27, 1963. The Record of Mariner The performance record of Mariner 2 exceeded that of any spacecraft previously launched from Earth. It performed the first and most distant trajectory correcting manoeuvre in deep space, firing a rocket motor at the greatest distance from the Earth, 1,492,000 miles, on September 4, 1962. The spacecraft transmitted continuously for four months, sending back to the Earth some 90 million bits of information while using only 3 watts of transmitted power. Useful telemetry measurements were made at another record distance from the Earth, 53.9 million miles, on January 3, 1963. Mariner 2 was the first spacecraft to operate in the immediate vicinity of another planet and return useful scientific information to the Earth, approximately 21,598 miles from Venus, on December 14, 1962. Measurements were made closest to the Sun, 65.3 million miles away, 
December 27, 1962. Mariner's communication system operated for the longest continuous period in interplanetary space, 129 days, August 27, 1962, to January 3, 1963. Mariner achieved the longest continuous operation of a spacecraft attitude stabilization system in space, and at a greater distance from the Earth than any previous spacecraft. 129 days, August 27, 1962 to January 3, 1963, at 53.9 million miles from Earth.